Hello, in this video you and I are going to replace a sail drive diaphragm. This is a Volvo Penta sail drive diaphragm, it's from a 120C sail drive unit but they're pretty much all the same. First of all, I am not an expert. I haven't done this job countless times. In fact, this is the very first time that I'm doing this job. However, that is to your advantage as well because I'm a guy who generally knows his way around a toolkit, but any mistakes that I make while doing this, I will share them with you. So you can see things that I do. If I do something wrong, you can avoid doing that and I can make the mistakes on your behalf. So that's why you should watch this video. Why should you change your sail drive diaphragm? Well, Volvo Penta recommend that you change these once every seven years. Whether that is necessary or not is a different matter. I've heard of, of these seals being very old and being almost brand new in condition. However, this boat has the original diaphragm from 1992. This is 2018, so it's gone a little bit beyond its seven years. But that's another interesting thing. We can look at the old diaphragm when we get it out and we'll see if there's any deterioration and any signs of perishing or cracking or any other signs that it may have been about to fail if I'd have left it in place. Before we get started doing the job, let's just have a quick look at an overview of what's involved. We've just purchased this boat and we've not really made it our own yet, so don't judge us. We have an extremely dirty, oily bilge in there. We're gonna get that sorted, but initially we need to crack on with the most important jobs. So that said, here we are. We are lucky in some respects on this boat that we have good access to the engine and sail drive area. We've got an access panel here in the aft head. I've removed the steps, companionway steps here and here. That gives us more access there and in the aft cabin we have quite a large access panel there and another one here so that's good it gives us good access generally into the area that we need to be in however a problem that we do have is down here you can see there isn't really much room at all here this is a very busy area and what we need to do is remove this sail drive unit and pull it up into the boat so having no access there at the back is a bit of a problem. What we're gonna to have to do is disconnect the sail drive from the engine. We are going to unbolt the engine mounts here and move the engine forwards, supporting it with some wood at the back. And that should allow us to get the sail drive unit out. Now looking at this, like I say, I've never done this before, but looking at it, what I think I'll be able to do is pull the engine forward far enough that it disengages from the sail drive and then I hope that by unbolting the back of the sail drive here I'm going to be able to rotate it in position and that should hopefully give me the clearance to bring it out through there but time will tell. This is the kit from Volvo Penta and it comes with the necessary parts and also a very nice useful instruction manual so it does give you a step-by-step -step overview of what you need to do to complete this job. So that's how I will be doing it. I'll be following these instructions. Okay, step one is to drain the oil. However, step minus one is to remove the propeller. So I'll go and show you that now. And here's our little daughter, Emma. You might hear her in the background every now and then. You're a happy little girl, aren't you? Yes, you are. You gonna sneeze? Bless you! <laughs> Before I head outside, just gonna do one very quick thing, which is to remove the dipstick from the sail drive oil. That will allow air in from above as the oil is draining down and it will drain down more quickly. Step minus one, remove the propeller. So six millimeter Allen key, you rotate the stainless steel bolt anti-clockwise that comes out you can then get a long lever a long screwdriver or such and then you rotate the cone anti-clockwise and that unscrews you can have the engine in gear I believe it's reverse for this and that will hold the prop in position while you unscrew the cone 
there we are, falls off, just like that. Now all you need to do is pull the prop and it will come off the shaft. <laughs> Moving on to step one of the Volvo Penta instructions, I'm going to drain down the oil out of the sail drive and to do that I just need to remove this plug. Before I attempt that I'm going to get a nice tool and clean out all the remnants of paint in here because if you do leave paint in there it's far more likely to slip. Just like the dentist. <laughs> What you're about to see is an outrageous misuse of tools. This is the largest flat blade screwdriver that I've got right now and it's not large enough. I haven't attempted to take this off with this screwdriver because it's too small. So I'm going to make do with what I do have which is a steel ruler and a adjustable spanner. I know this doesn't look professional but actually in my opinion it's more professional to use this which I know I've tried and fits absolutely perfectly there's no chance of that slipping rather than use a screwdriver which is the correct tool but it's the wrong size This oil is disgusting. If you look at that, it's a greeny yellow pea soup type colour. And that is not new clean oil. So as part of this job, I was already going to do this anyway. I'm going to remove the, the bearing housing here. I'm going to remove this part of the sail drive. That will mean this end of the sail drive is a little bit narrower and that will hopefully help me get it through the hull. While I'm doing that I'm also going to be replacing the shaft seals and that will hopefully eliminate any water ingress into the sail drive unit once we launch. It's bath time for Emma. Emma you're having a bath. Splish splash splish splash. Right then, back to following the Volvo Penta instructions. Number one, drain down the oil, we've done that. Number two, remove the wet exhaust. So I'm about to do that now. I could struggle on with that for another few hours and I'm sure I'd get it off eventually, but I'm not gonna waste time. I haven't got time to waste, so I'm gonna use the multi-cutter and I'm just gonna cut this hose off just below the elbow there. We now need to disconnect the cooling water inlet hose and the gear linkage. Uh, the engine has to be 
in neutral or the cell drive unit has to be in neutral which it is now so I now need to disconnect this here is the water inlet seacock and I don't know about you but I do not like these at all I think they are rubbish they always seize this one is seized and if that happens you don't have many options you can knock off this split pin and then you can get a spanner on there but this is made of plastic so you can't put much torque on it and I just I don't like it at all so I have bought a replacement for this made out of DZR brass that's desinkification resistant brass and it has a ball valve which you know has an on off a lever which is very easy to see whether it's on or off so I'm going to be replacing this as part of this job so I'm now going to disconnect this hose as per the instructions while we're on the subject of cooling water this engine at the moment the only means of cooling is via this valve and therefore the the holes the intake holes on the sail drive unit we are at some point probably going to be transiting the french canals and even if that wasn't the case i actually think it's nice to have two sources of cooling water for your engine just in case you know you suck up a plastic bag or whatever so i will be adding that i'm going to be adding a t-piece somewhere around here up above the water line uh, near to the the strainer and on this boat these two sinks in the galley originally had each sink had its own seacock underneath here so there was one of these for each of the sinks I have teed those sinks together up at about this level way above the water line and I'm stealing this seacock and you can see the hose tail on it there. I've already prepped that. I'm gonna be running a secondary cooling water intake from this seacock to go to the T that I just mentioned in here. And then the engine will have two independent sources of cooling water. I'm now going to disconnect the gear linkage. And as far as I can see, the easiest way to do that is remove the split pin just behind this bracket. I've removed that split pin which was a bit of a faff because there's not much room in there and be careful if you're doing this job when you disconnect that there's a little washer on the back that you could quite easily drop. I now need to disconnect underneath this ridiculously inconveniently placed warm air ducting hose and I believe they're eight millimeter bolts I just need to release this from the cell drive unit. It's not a lot of room to remove this little P bracket which holds the gear change selector cable to the sail drive but I think that's going to be a running theme for this job so I'm not going to keep complaining about access because it could be worse. I used to work on aircraft actually, I used to work on fast jets and uh, helicopters in the Royal Air Force and some of the access there was unbelievable it was almost like the designers were purposefully trying to have a laugh with the engineers who had to work on them so this in comparison is not too bad Again, there's a little washer there on the back so I've got to be careful to not drop that okay I've removed the gear selector there but that's now out of the way and I've just checked if I pull on these there's plenty of slack so I don't need to disconnect these Back to the Volvo Penta instructions, that is step three complete and step four according to the instructions is to start disconnecting lots of bolts followed by step five which is to block up the engine with some bits of wood underneath to support it. Well I don't know about you but I don't think they're the right way around really I'd prefer to block the engine first and then disconnect all the fasteners second so that's what I'm going to do. So. This engine is held in position by just three mounts. You've got the mount here, starboard, forward, 
port forward and then you've got the aft mount which is uh, underneath the rear end of the sail drive just if you look at where that tissue paper is it's just behind that so it has three points of support we're going to be moving this engine forward I don't know exactly how far I think what I'd like to do is move this bolt hole move the whole engine forward so that this hole lines up with uh, this attachment point and I may be able to stick the bolt back in in this new position I'm hoping that will give me enough room to do what I need to do and I believe there's enough room for me if I wedge the engine here there should be enough travel there for me to to be able to do that so I've just spent quite a long time walking around looking for wedges and I've got three which I think are suitable there is this one here and what I'm going to do with that is jiggle it underneath here there we are um, I'll hammer that in place and basically at the moment that's not going to do anything because it's not supporting it from the right place however when we move the engine forward uh, the weight should come onto that wedge as well so this is kind of a backup then we've got the two main wedges which are these I chop the ends off them to make them fit and basically I plan on hammering these home down here. Uh, get plenty of pressure on there and I'm hoping that that will be enough support for the engine for it not to drop when I do the later stages of work if it does I'll cross that bridge when I come to it right let me get this wedged up and let's see what happens Okay, that's the engine blocked up now I would have loved to have had some nice straight bits of wood like this going under the engine but I couldn't find uh, the correctly sized wood that would that would support the engine and also get around this corner to get in there because these are in the way so you may be luckier than I am in that respect and you may be able to put a flat piece of wood under the engine which I would prefer to do this doesn't look really super stable the wedges could roll over and the engine could drop it's something I'm gonna to have to be aware of and I am your guinea pig we'll see if this works now the instructions aren't very clear on step four so we're going back from step five to step four now as to what exactly gets removed you know this is a different kind of cell drive from the one that I've got although in other parts of the instructions it refers to my specific cell drive so I don't know why they didn't do that all the way through but anyway it is what it is I've just had a look myself we have six bolts to remove one two three on this side and the same on the other side to separate the cell drive from the engine and what I'd like to do at this stage I think is remove these bolts holding the engine mounts and these six bolts one two three four five six and I'm gonna leave everything else as it is I'm gonna leave the aft engine support where it is and that will hopefully just hold the sail drive in position. I'm gonna try and move the engine first and then I'll deal with the sail drive afterwards. I've seen the access isn't great. I may be able to pull it out through here if I'm very lucky. Uh, that's what I'm hoping for. But if not, then I've just been looking at the sail drive itself. And although this isn't in the instructions and I haven't looked into it in any depth, it looks as though I could remove this back plate from the sail drive and that would be a much smaller unit to get out here so that may be another option you'll have to excuse the lack of light here but the work lamp that i'm using the bulb has blown so i'm gonna to have to go and buy another one but at the moment i don't have time to do that so you'll just have to make do with some torch light i'm afraid okay i've just removed those six bolts securing the sail drive to the engine and some of them were extremely tight so i just got the ring spanner end on there and then gave it some wax with a lump hammer and they all came off easily and none of them are damaged so they have been bagged up now ready to be stored carefully and i'm now about to remove the four forward engine mounting bracket bolts i now need to move the engine forward walk it forward so I've got this lump of wood 
this will be the process. I'm going to have to uh, do this with both hands. So I'm going to have to put the camera down somewhere. But you get the idea. I'm wedging the bottom of this down there and then as I lift this up there you go, you can see that gives me a long lever and I can use that to pull the engine forward. Being careful that it's not going to drop off the blocks as I do so. Just going to uh, put a little bit of leverage in this top gap, so there's a little gap there. I'm going to uh, put something down there and lever these two apart because the cell drive is being pulled towards the engine as I'm pushing the engine forward. But it is moving, so I'm sure I'll get this done. Okay, it's got a flat blade screwdriver there. Just going to gently price these apart. Oh, you can see it's coming. Now what I would say at this stage is I can already tell this is going to be a pain in the neck to get back together afterwards. <laughs> it's quite tight to get off. But we like a challenge don't we? I don't know how easily you can see this in the video, but the gap at the top here is smaller than the gap at the bottom. So just to help it along in its way, I'm just going to stick some wedges in here, wooden wedges, and tap them in. And now continue wiggling with the long lever. So as an alternative, what I'm going to do is go outside the boat, tie a line around the bottom of the sail drive and pull it towards the keel. That should help me achieve what I'm trying to achieve here. There we go. I think that's done it. Go upstairs and have a look. Yes, that's uh, certainly split the cell drive from the engine. So now let's try and get this engine further forward. You can see the position of this wedge isn't so great but this isn't that difficult touch wood uh, basically touch wood haha <laughs> I'm using a wooden lever <laughs> look I've got the wooden lever down there in the bottom of the corner of the engine and I am holding the camera while doing this so bear that in mind but if I just lift up the lever I can take the weight off the engine I'm actually lifting that there and I can now reposition the wedge hammer it home Take the weight off the lever and the engine sits on the wedge there. So you do have to be careful doing this, of course. I'm not just throwing it around left, right and centre, but it's not that difficult. You know, it's not a thousand kilos of engine we're dealing with here. It's about 150 kilos. So it's heavy, but it's not very difficult to manage with, with levers. OK, we've got a problem here. This is the engine mount on the port side. And you can see that's welded to the base plate there. Um, I'm putting a lot of stress on these, I'm hanging the front weight of the engine on there and evidently this one wasn't up to it because the welder snapped. So to be honest I'm not too 
sad about that because I'm glad it happened now rather than when we were motoring around somewhere in a storm or whatever. I asked if I could borrow some welding gear and uh, although that wasn't possible a very kind guy named Ross welded this up for me in 10 minutes. He didn't even have a welding mask, he was actually using sunglasses to weld this and a very old set of welding gear so I'm very grateful to Ross and that is very solid, I've bashed it around with a hammer and it is nicely welded there. I just want to demonstrate this lever again here, there's a little bit more light here and you can see what's happening a bit better. Basically again I've got the camera in one hand and the lever in the other. There you go, you can quite easily move the engine around wherever you need it so it's not as complicated or as difficult as you might think. <laughs> I'm now going to remove these two nuts which secure the rear end of the sail drive to the boat, to the mount. They're just two plain stainless steel nuts and they're tightened down against each other to lock them in place. This ring is also retained by the bolts there that run through the mounting so they have to come out, there's one this side and one on the other side. Well this is the moment of truth, there's not much access here at the back so I'm hoping I'm going to be able to rotate it to about here and then just lift it straight up but we will see if we can do that or not right now. Oh yes, oh yes. Try and push that ring down off the diaphragm. There we go. Right, I'm going to need to move the engine forward just a touch more. Okay, I've just moved the engine forward another probably two inches. To do that I had to disconnect a big electrical cable that was starting to get tight and now we'll see if I have the clearance to get this out. There, she blows. Well, that's done out then. All I need to do now is take it downstairs via half a ladder, because the engine's in the way, so I can't put the bottom half in, and the ladder down the back of the boat, which then backs onto a killer fence with big spikes on top. Before I start, I'm just going to give this a clean up with some vinegar. And that will kind of eat away this, the, the calciferous deposits from the marine growth. They're very well hidden here, but there are a bunch of shims that live inside here. Okay, that's all of them, and they all need to go back on. This is very unexpected and interesting. All the way up here, there are some quite big pieces of muscle. Which, again, you know, I'm surprised that you would get such large pieces up so high. Just so I can't get the orientation of this wrong, I'm just going to mark up the position of this relative to that rear mount. And there are a further three 6mm bolts to remove. All the previous ones were 6mm as well. Ok, 
Okay, it's coming. There we are. So, came off together with the diaphragm. And yes, this does need to go on in the same way it comes off. And there's an O-ring on the internal part there to change. Well, with many years of cooling water being drawn in through here on its way to the engine for cooling water, there's been quite a lot of salt deposits left behind. So I'm gonna clean all these out and then I will clean all the mating surfaces starting at the top and working my way down. I'll start to rebuild it one step at a time. One thing to be aware of while you're doing this job is that this slip clutch can come off. So if you do what I just did and tilt this up to clean underneath, this falls out. While I'm working on this sail drive, I'm going to replace this valve because I don't like them at all. First of all, there's no immediate visual indication of whether it's open or closed because it, it looks like a gate valve. It's a quarter turn valve, but it looks like a gate valve because of this round handle. So from a distance on a valve, on a ball valve, you know it's open or closed. Also, this stem here is plastic and the handle is plastic. So if I try and close this valve now, Let's say this is sheared off or the hose is broken and we've got seawater pouring into the boat. So I want to turn off the seacock. I'm standing right next to this, not working in a restricted access area and I can't close that valve. They're rubbish. So I'm going to take this off and I'm going to replace it with a corrosion resistant. This is DZR. Uh, desinkification resistant brass, the hose tail as well. So I'm going to remove this valve and screw this new one in so that I've got a proper ball valve. Well as if to prove the point, this is very tight so to take it off I was going to remove this hose tail and it snapped. So um, there you are, if you imagine this happened on your boat, something banged against this, this snaps off, you've now got water coming in, you can't stop it with the valve. You know, you can plug it, you can put anything you like in there really. A carrot would work, a piece of potato, you know, it's not the end of the world. But if you're not there when this happens, then um, your boat could sink, potentially. So I'm quite fussy about underwater hull fittings and uh, anything that could sink the boat, I want to be hunky-dory. Well that's extremely difficult to get off even with a long lever I think I've just found out why. You can see there on the base there's some sealant. So I'm going to remove the valve handle and then I'm going to heat this and hopefully that will loosen the sealant and then I'll try again. Well, this is extremely difficult to remove, so I'm gonna try a different approach. Rather than heating this, I'm going to try and heat the aluminium on the inside here. That should expand the hole slightly. And then I'm gonna use uh, just an air duster. This is quite a handy technique, actually. Basically, if you turn an air duster upside down and then spray it, it squirts out a liquid, which is really, really cold. Super, super cold. So I'm going to heat up the hole and I'm gonna cool down the valve and try and shrink it, see if that'll help me just get it free. You see that's frozen over, just with the moisture from the air. Wish me luck. Ah, 
a very awkward shape to get any decent amount of purchase on as well. Right, I'm going to hit this with a hammer. It's starting to annoy me. It has started to move now. Hurrah! I'm now setting up the position of the ball valve and the hose tail etc. You don't necessarily need to have all these really tight for it to seal as long as you're using some of this. This is Loctite 572, really good stuff. It's a medium strength thread lock and it's for below the waterline use. This is what I used when I replaced all our seacocks and skin fittings. Uh, there'll be another video on our channel about that so check that out if you're interested in that video. This stuff is excellent, it sets very hard but it's not impossible to remove things afterwards and you can put a load of this in the joint that you want to work on, you can orientate it as you like it and then you leave it to set. While it's wet you can still work it, move it around to different positions and that doesn't stop it from sealing and then afterwards when it sets it seals and it's very useful because you can position things exactly, you can have the handle where you want it and the hose tail exactly where you want it. So it's very useful. So I'm trying to set this up now in a way that won't interfere with things on the boat. Some of you may know this, so I apologize if you do. If you don't though, this is very important. These fittings are marked CR, which is corrosion resistant. They're made from desinkification resistant brass. And that's very important for any fitting which is gonna be used below the waterline because standard brass, which is fitted actually by a lot of mainstream boat manufacturers as seacocks for example which is quite crazy in my opinion they use standard brass and basically over time in seawater the zinc content of the brass gets leached out and what you're left with is a very high copper content uh, material but it's it loses its strength it becomes carroty and you can quite easily snap things off so if you were to use a standard brass ball valve on here over time it could get so weak that just with turning the handle you could snap it off so uh, small details but they're very important and depending on where you buy things it's not always particularly very clear whether what you are buying is bronze or brass or corrosion resistant brass you can put loads of this on here because as I said it's a medium strength and it is possible to undo things afterwards should that become necessary at some point in the future. Okay, that'll do. Same again here and then you just continue to do that all the way along. Right, just before fitting this hose tail I've been inside the boat just to double check that it was the right size and it isn't so I'm going to have to get another hose tail of the correct size for the diameter of hose that we've got inside the boat. I'm going to remove the old sail drive seal. And before I get rid of this, I've just remembered now, I'm going to make sure that I get the orientation of the new seal correct in the sense that it has a date stamp on it and where it was, it was visible inside the boat. So I'm going to orientate it the same way so that it's visible again. Here it is over there. So. This one says 2017 and this is 2018. So I've lost a year, but hey. So you gotta make a mental note of that. There we are. Okay. I'm now gonna give this a good clean up, both sides, and replace the O-ring. I've run all the way around this with a scraper, or actually a steel rule because I don't have a scraper and I don't have time to buy one 
because we're launching the boat in about six days. I need to get this done. Um, and I'm now cleaning it off with a Scotch Bright scouring pad and some vinegar. The only problem with this is, it makes me want some chips. Okay, I've cleaned this side up with vinegar and now one of the advantages of being on board with a lady is you've always got a supply of nail polish remover so thank you very much for seller. Uh, I'm now going to clean this side with acetone and then I'll do the same on the other side and it will be ready for reassembly. I'm going to fit the new o-ring now. I've cleaned off the uh, any residue of acetone. I used saliva for that actually which is a bit disgusting I suppose but there we are that's what I did um, and now I've got some gear oil here which is what's going to be going into the sail drive so I know that this is compatible with the o-ring and I'm just going to lubricate the o-ring before it gets installed Okay, now I'm going to get rid of all this oil from my hands so I don't transfer that to any of the surfaces I'm about to put Permatex on. Okay, I'm about to start reassembling this now and the IKEA-esque instructions aren't very clear about where Permatex goes. What the instructions are clear about is that this is a dry seal. There's to be no uh, lubricant, no grease, no um, sealing compounds, nothing. So this is a dry seal because it's clamped with pressure. However, Basically everywhere else I'm going to be putting Loctite MR5922 which is basically Permatex because it can't do any harm and also there's a little bit of corrosion taking place here, just tiny spots of pitting corrosion and this will act as a kind of jointing compound and hopefully reduce that occurring in the future. This is sealed here by the O-ring that we changed earlier on and I'll kind of stay away from, from that. I'll just let that seal via uh, the, the clamping pressure on the o-ring itself. I'm now going to remove this gasket and clean up this whole area. The shims, some of these are really tiny, so I've just used the locking wire that I snipped off before just to keep them all together so I don't lose them. Same process as before, I'll scrape it and then use the Scotch Bright with vinegar and then scotch bright with acetone and then saliva. <laughs> I'm not going to be shy with the permatex here. I'm going to put plenty on there. Don't forget your shins. Oh, 
I'm not too concerned about which bolt is which at the moment. I'm just getting them in there just to align the gasket. The two longer bolts go here, which is uh, to remember that if you are pushing, the prop is pushing in that direction. So you need two longer bolts here to resist that force. Then there's a sequence to tighten these. It's in the instructions, just standard sequence tightening. Um, and there are two torques. You go around them all first and you tighten them to 10 Newton meters and then you go with them all, round them all again and tighten them to 25 Newton meters. I made a mistake. These bolts here, these two, and these two have to be wire locked together and I fitted the bolts without holes here. So I'm gonna have to remove them and then rejig the positions and retorque it. See, I told you it was gonna be useful for me to be your guinea pig because you can avoid making the mistakes that I'm making. That's all done. It's time to lock these bolts now with some locking wire. On the diagram there, they've got a very simple method of locking it. But I used to do a lot of this when I was in the Royal Air Force. I used to work on aircraft and basically everything on there was wire locked. We used to use wire locking pliers to do it, but you can also do it by hand. And I've not tried to do this for a very long time. 15 years, I don't know, but I'm gonna give it a bash and see if I can remember. Hello, what are you doing? You're relaxing in the sunshine. <laughs> 27 degrees in the UK. Unbelievable. Okay, I finished prepping the cell drive. You can see some little patches of paint on it. Not very pretty, but they were just tiny little bits of, of uh, paint damage. So I've painted over them with ugly paint, which is out of sight, but it'll help prevent corrosion. I've done the same on the clamping ring as well. Little spots of paint on there. It's in pretty good condition, so I'm quite happy about that. I have come across a problem though, which I wasn't aware of, so I'll show you that now. This is the hole through which the sail drive bolts to the boat via this flexible coupling. And if I just put that in there, you'll see straight away the problem. There we are. The, the diameter there is way out, and basically the, the hard material of the stud has been eating away with a bit of vibration at the aluminium, and it's opened out this hole, and that's only gonna get worse over time if I don't do anything about it. So the proper fix would be to make up a bush to bridge this gap, but I don't have time for that. So I'm gonna do something else instead, which is very simple, and it doesn't sound like it would work, but I believe it will work very well. I have a section of mylar film here. This is 125 micron mylar film. I bought this for two pounds, including shipping, one pound 99 in fact, including shipping. So it's very cheap. They use it in printers, uh, but it's a really, really tough material. And basically all I need to do is cut a strip of this to the correct thickness, the same as the aluminium. And then I will roll it around the stud and pack out this gap. It's very simple, but it'll work. There we are then, that's taken out all the play and this will be securely held in position with the nuts. So the sail drive is about to go back in. Um, one thing to remember is to put the securing ring in first because I don't think it would pass over the top here. So you would have to take it out again and put the sail drive back in if you forgot to do that. The advantage of this seacock is it makes quite a nice handle. Okay, I need to drop this down, then I need to manoeuvre the securing ring up above the diaphragm here. So I'm not sure exactly how easy that's going to be, but we're about to find out. There we go. Excellent. Now I have to move this ring up above the seal. OK, 
okay I've got the cell drive back in position and I've got the mylar film into the hole that literally took me about 45 minutes just to get that in there it was a pain in the neck very frustrating but I got there in the end so that's now got the nut in place just to hold that all in position and I've got all the bolts in place on the clamping ring but they're not tight the clamping ring is free to move around and basically from what I've seen here I believe it would be possible to misclamp this seal if it's not concentric when you're tightening it up I think you could make a hash of this and that is not what we want so I've got it loose and I'm gonna jiggle around with the seal and the clamping ring until I'm happy that it's all concentric it's all centered and then I can start to tighten down on the bolts these bolts here are to be tightened to 20 newton meters and then the bolts that go into the engine are 40 newton meters now these clamping ring bolts there is no sequence tightening specified in the instructions but just standard practice I'm going to use a, a kind of sequence tightening approach when I come to tighten these bolts down it's almost time to marry up the engine and the cell drive now so before I do that I'm gonna put a nice big blob of grease on the splines here I've just come down below the boat to carve the end of this lever just to hopefully make it fit in a few different areas better. And while I'm down here, I'll show you what's going on outside the boat. So I have a, uh, a ratchet strap coming back from a boat stand towards the sail drive leg. And that's just got some tension on it with the trucker's hitch. And same again here with a line going around the keel. So the sail drive is braced fore and aft and it's supported, the weight is taken off it by this boat stand. So I can obviously adjust these as the job progresses if I need to, but I'm hoping that this is already in a good position. And in either case, I'm hoping that I'm gonna be able to continue to do this job on my own without asking help from anybody else. Oh, look at that! Straight in there. Woohoo! I thought that was going to take hours. <laughs> oh yes. I'm now going to fit the six bolts securing the sail drive to the engine. If you look here, you can see there's a tiny bit of misalignment, this gap. It's kind of like a, a wedge shape that starts off wide down here and gets thinner towards the top. That is nothing to worry about, as long as you get the bolt in there without cross-threading it, which is extremely important, like so. Then, as you tighten up on these bolts, it will close that gap and it will align the engine and the sail drive perfectly. The best thing about working on this is that I can look through the gap here and I can see Emma having a bath. Hiya! Daddy could do with the wash as well. <laughs> I've now reconnected the steering linkage and the exhaust hose, the wet exhaust. I put two new hose clamps on there and the air intake and the electrical connector here and also the large diameter electrical cable that I disconnected to give me access. I'm now about to fit the engine mounting bolts. You can see it's not perfectly aligned there, but that's easy to rectify. You just get a screwdriver and pull it where you want it. Okay, that's all the work up here complete at the moment. I'm gonna go down and work on the sail drive now, the parts that are sticking out of the bottom of the boat. Me turning around to look at her. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I've already checked the bearings, they all seem absolutely fine, which is good news. So I'm just going to clean this up, clean up the splines and fit new shaft seals, new O-rings, two new O-rings, clean up again this whole interface here and then put it back on and we'll be ready for oil. Well, I made another mistake so you don't have to. I was cleaning this and a gust of wind came and blew the crud that I was cleaning off this onto this. So I've now got lots of little abrasive particles stuck to the bearings here. So I'm gonna clean this off with solvent before I reassemble it. I'm now gonna push out these seals. I wanna maintain this internal face nice and intact, but I don't really have any other better way of getting these out than using the handle of a hammer. So I'll obviously clean up this internal surface and prepare that for the new seals. While cleaning this up, I've just realized there's a slight problem here. On this outer edge, there's a raised section. So the diameter is smaller, so you can't get your seal in that way. And on this side, there's the outer bearing race and some shims and the diameter is smaller there, so you can't get your seal in that way. So this bearing race and the shims have to come out. If I had the right size socket, I could put that in there. However, I don't, but seek and you shall find. I just looked next to the boat and I'll show you what I found. I thought this looked about the right diameter, so I pulled out the internal part of this acro and look what we've got. Perfect. I'm just going to remove these two old O-rings now. I've got replacements for these. And then I'll get some heat on this, on the external part to expand it. And then I'll cool the bearing. That should make it quite easy to get out. I hope. I don't need that because just the heat was enough to expand that outer section and the bearing is free. And in this particular drive we've got three shims. Here we have the new seals, quite expensive these to be honest. but. They do an important job. So we have two, they go back to back, like so. And one of these seals against the water and one seals against the oil. So we can't heat this up too much, of course, because we would burn these. So we're just gonna have to do what we can with them cold. And I'm just gonna try and knock it home with a, a socket. I'm doing my best to get this to go in square and if I see it just going in a different direction then I'm acting against that, knocking it down straight again. I'm going to help this along with a little bit of transmission oil. Okay, the oil helped. That's in position. 
and now we've got this inner one. Ah, oh, there we go. That almost goes in with just finger pressure. Much easier. It would be better to have a, a larger socket, but I don't have one. Nearly there. Another two or three mil. Excellent. Now we need to get the shims and outer bearing race back in. Okay, I've cleaned the shims with some solvent. I'm gonna drop them in there. And I'm gonna try and freeze this with the small amount of air duster that I've got left and see if that'll drop in there with the cold. Not enough liquid left, I don't think. We really do need the, uh, the liquid to do this properly, I'm afraid. So I'm gonna have to go for a little bit of heat. Being careful not to damage the seals with the heat. And obviously, I'm trying not to heat the bearing race if I can help it, so that stays cool and small and the housing gets hot and expands. Okay, now I'll try and gently tap this home. Okay, that's not pretty, doing that with a hammer, but you can see there is no damage. That's all fine. I've cleaned out the grooves there, and I'm going to insert two new O-rings. I'm gonna use gear oil to lubricate them. Okay, now we're ready to put this back on the shaft. I've cleaned up the mating faces here where the O-rings are going to go. And actually I've cleaned the hole inside as far as I could get with my hand. And we are now ready to put this back in. Those nice new O-rings are doing their job well. I'll just tap this home with a hammer. You can also pull it back on using the, uh, the bolts, but that's not a problem. Okay, now it's time for the bolts.
Now, before I fill this with oil, I'm just gonna go and double check that the gear linkage and everything is working. So this is neutral. You can turn it both ways. I've just engaged a head. Yeah, that's good. And a stern. Excellent. Now fill this with oil. And for your information, that took approximately three litres of oil. I'm about to prepare this now to glue on the external seal. And as always, preparation is everything in a job like this. Basically, I'm gonna sand this all down with different grades of sandpaper, starting off with the rougher grades, P60, and then I'll do it three times down to 120. Once that's been well abraded and there's no shininess left, I want it to be nice and matte and clean. I'm then gonna get some solvent and clean it, and make sure there's no grease whatsoever on there. And then I'm going to sand the actual seal itself as well with sandpaper and roughen that up and make sure there's no grease on that as well. Then I'm gonna use a sealant called CT1, which I believe is extremely good for this kind of thing. And it's not too expensive either, which is a bonus. Just thought I'd mention this, after I refitted the anode, I do what I always do and I checked it with a multimeter. Basically you want there to be almost no resistance between the anode and whatever it is that it's protecting. So in this case it's protecting the cell drive. So if I put my multimeter onto the resistance setting and if I go from, it doesn't matter which way around your leads are, it doesn't make any difference. If you go from the anode, dig that right in there and then you could test on the cell drive but I don't want to damage the paint. So if I instead just go to the prop shaft, then there we are, 0 0.2 ohms. So that's a very, very low reading and that's great. That's what we want to see. That means that there's very little resistance between the two and this will work and protect the sail drive. It can happen that you reconnect the anode and if you measure that, you might get 10 ohms. If I were to walk around this boatyard now and measure the resistance between the anode and the things that they're protecting, you will quite often find that they're not actually doing anything because they're just sitting there, but they're not connected properly electrically. So you don't have the protection that you want. So it's worth spending two minutes to check. And then if you don't have the resistance, the low resistance that you want, you can just remove the anode, clean up the mating surfaces with a little bit of sandpaper and then refit it and try again. That should have fixed it. I'm going to be fitting this with a sealant called CT1. This is a difficult task for any sealant, so it will be interesting to see how well this fares in time. Okay, that should be lots. Okay, well that was quite a lot of faffing about, 20 minutes or so of messing around, pushing that down and kind of fairing it, fairing the gap between the hull and the seal. I hope that's a good job now. And a good thing about CT1 is you can remove it quite easily, which is very useful. So I'm gonna go and get myself cleaned up now. I'm also applying an experimental home brew treatment to the propeller, but there's no point in me telling you what it is yet because I have no idea if it's gonna work and it may fall off the first time I start the engine in the water.
Thank you for watching. If you haven't done so already, then click subscribe to our YouTube channel, that's free. And if you tick on the bell, then you'll get notifications when we send out new videos. And if this has saved you a lot of money and you're feeling generous, then you can also check out our Patreon page where you can give as little as a dollar per month to help us to make videos like this in the future. Okay, thanks for watching. We will see you in the next video. Ciao.